my name is Rachel, and I'm going to introduce you to a fantastic composer called Beethoven. And with the help of the Scottish Chamber Orchestra and pianist Paul Lewis, we're going to explore his second piano concerto. Ludwig van Beethoven was born 250 years ago and is now thought of as being one of the greatest composers who ever lived. He was known for taking a small idea, something like da 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 da, and turning it into something truly magical. He was born in 1770 in Bonn, Germany, and here are a few quick facts about him. He never married, but he did have a secret girlfriend. He was a huge fan of another composer called Mozart, but the two never met. And he was a terrible teacher. He would get really frustrated with his piano students, so much so that once he bit one of them. I don't really recommend that. Unfortunately, despite being a musical genius, he was a bit of a nightmare. If you'd have run into him in the streets of Vienna in 1820, you would have thought he was rather odd. His clothes were messy, his hair was messy, and he probably didn't smell too good either. He was known for walking along, charging along, and suddenly stopping and exclaiming loudly. He would sing, laugh, or shout out loud. He was happy to see you one minute, raging with anger the next. And it's all because only one thing mattered to Beethoven, and that was music. And if you got in the way of his ability to create music, he would get very, very cross indeed. When he was around 25 years old and at the peak of his fame, he sadly started to lose his hearing. All of this crazy anger, joy, sadness got into his music, and that's what makes it incredibly exciting to listen to. He was, and some people say he still is, the greatest composer who ever lived. He wrote this piano concerto in 1788 when he was a young man trying to make a name for himself as a pianist. A concerto is a piece for soloist who normally stands or sits at the front and orchestra plays behind doing a lot of the accompanying and the backup music. Beethoven wanted to be known at this point as a pianist, so he held the piano part to this piece in his head. He didn't write it down or allow it to be published. And then he went on the road across Europe playing the piece, trying to open up some new opportunities for himself. In 1801, when he was beginning to become famous, he decided it was finally time to get this piece published. But in the intervening years, he had written another piano concerto, had it written down, and got it published. And that's why the second piano concerto that he wrote is known as number one. And this one, the first one he wrote, is known as number two. This concerto, like all concertos from around this time, is in three big sections known as movements. The first movement is fast and a little bit angry, the middle movement is sad and thoughtful, and the last movement is flashy and lots of fun. So let's begin our exploration by watching the beginning of the first movement, played by the Scottish Chamber Orchestra and pianist Paul Lewis. Now as you watch this clip, listen and watch carefully, because Paul, our pianist, doesn't seem to be doing that much.
So Paul, our soloist, our star, our pianist, didn't really play very much in that extract. And that's because he has to sit there for about two and a half minutes and listen to the orchestra play all the tunes that he's then about to play. Can you imagine how that must feel to sit there hearing all these tunes, knowing that you've then got to launch into them and often from memory. The first tune, the very beginning, I think sounds a little bit like Beethoven is angry. Let's take another listen to it. I think that sounds like Beethoven is saying, oh, I'm feeling really cross. Listen again, see if you can fit those words to this tune. That's a classic Beethoven tune. It's filled with emotion and drama. And you'll hear that tune throughout the first movement. It flies across the orchestra and it goes over to the piano. Let's hear what it sounds like when Paul plays it for the first time. I actually think it sounds more cross when Paul plays it on the piano. Maybe that's because he's been sat waiting for so long. Now I mentioned that Beethoven was a man of contrasts. So a few minutes into the piece, there's another tune and this one is much calmer. Let's take a listen. there's a very sorrowful tune that sounds like this. I think that's Beethoven saying sorry for the anger at the beginning of the piece. So this movement is made up of those three tunes and it's constantly changing emotion, classic Beethoven. Towards the end of the movement, there's a section called a cadenza. This is where the pianist plays all on his own. We're gonna pick it up from the cadenza now, listen out for that angry tune. Remember it goes, Ugh! I'm feeling really cross. And keep on listening to when the orchestra come back in for the end of the movement. Ask yourself this, does the piece end angrily or has it all got nice and calm?
Beethoven's concerto offers us another contrast. It is slow, sad, and thoughtful. Again, the orchestra introduced the tune at the beginning and the pianist has a bit of a wait. So let's listen to the beginning of that second movement and I suggest you close your eyes and just let your mind wander. There's a lovely section in the middle of this movement where the piano accompanies the orchestra. I think it sounds as if the piano is the bubbling water of a brook and the orchestra are sailing on top of the surface. Take a listen. movement sounds like a conversation between soloist and orchestra. As you listen to it now, try and work out what they're talking about. movement is lots of fun and this time the piano starts with the tune. This tune sounds to me like a rustic dance so imagine it's 1788 what kind of dance moves would you be doing to this? Bumpy, short, long rhythm at the beginning is known as a Scotch snap. And back in the 1780s, it would have been the height of fashion to include it. It comes from the world of Scottish folk music. The third movement is in a clever musical shape called Rondo. So if you imagine a circle, as you travel around a circle, you end up where you started. And that's what happens in a musical Rondo. The idea that you hear at the beginning, the idea that we just heard, keeps returning with contrasting ideas in between. So the first contrasting moment comes here. It sounds a little bit like someone is skipping along. Thank you. 
did you hear how the ideas were flung around across the orchestra? It sounds like musical tennis, and it makes the piece lots of fun to play. After this, Beethoven goes back to the first idea again with the scotch snap, and then there's another contrasting idea that sounds like the pianist is playing tricks on the rest of the musicians. <laughs> Did you hear how those piano notes seem to fall in the wrong places? It's almost as if Paul, the pianist, is trying to put the rest of the musicians off. Well, it's just a rhythmic device known as syncopation. At this point in the piece, Beethoven does something very clever. So if we call the opening tune A, and then the skipping tune B, we've so far had A, B, A, then we had the tricky tune, let's call that C, so we've had A, B, A, C, and then Beethoven sends the structure backwards. So the full thing is A, B, A, C, A, B, A. And that means it's the same forwards as backwards. It is a palindrome. If that sounds complicated, don't worry. As you listen to the piece, just listen out for that opening dancing tune, and then you'll always know where you are within the structure. At the very end of the piece, Beethoven creates a section called a coda. Coda just means ending, and this is a chance for composer, soloists, and orchestra to really show off. So, we're gonna end this film with the last version of the dancing theme going into the coda and the end of the piece. If you want to watch the full theme, click on the links below, where there's also lots more to explore. Thanks for watching.